He has many areas of clinical expertise and practice that you might find of interest, including anxiety and depressive <coughs> conditions, substance use disorders, marriage and relationship related problems, issues related to illness, loss, grief, and death, and general stress. He also provides psychological evaluations, specifically diagnostic and personality assessment, and forensic evaluations and consultations, specializing in sex offender risk assessments. Prior to this, he was a psychologist in the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Prisons in DC, where he supervised the development and implementation of policy and clinical procedures to align with the Child Safety and Protection Act. He's also a past president of the D.C. Psychological Association and a current member of the Board of Directors for the D.C. Psychological Association. With no further ado, please welcome Dr. Tony Jimenez. Well, um, Neil and Alan did great jobs, and um, I am going to probably echo much of what they've said. I'll try to infuse maybe something um, a, a little different. Um, what I'd like to start with is just reminding you what this colloquium is about. Um, in preparing for this, I uh, did read uh, the interview of Dr. Uh, Cottingham many years ago, and I would encourage you to read it. Um, it talks about experiential learning and personal growth and development. I have found that in my career uh, with the Bureau of Prisons, those principles uh, found their way in just about everything I did. So just to remind you, the Society for Counseling Psychology defines counseling psychology as a specialty within a professional psychology that maintains a focus on facilitating personal and interpersonal functioning across lifespan, pays particular attention to emotional, social, vocational, educational, health-related, developmental, and organizational concerns. I want to underscore that. I know that many of you are in master's programs as well as doctoral programs. Um, I'm going to argue today that counseling psychology and counseling uh, is extremely well suited to work in the field of corrections. And I'm also going to argue um, that it's equally uh, a suitable setting for women as well as men. And this is, uh, of course, we worked in the federal prison system. This is what the Federal Bureau of Prisons mission statement is. And if you look at that, particularly at the bottom, um, after the emphasis of protecting society, uh, its mission is to provide work and other self-improvement opportunities to assist offenders in becoming law-abiding citizens. All of the programs that uh, were offered in the system and are offered today serve this function. What's the landscape? The landscape that we're talking about in the federal system as of 2017, 185,000 plus inmates in 122 facilities. 75% <coughs> of the inmates in the federal system are between the ages of 26 and 50. There are some 10-year-old bank robbers, believe it or not, they're not housed in federal facilities. They're contracted out for various reasons. Um, as far as gender, 93.2% male, 6.8% female. You can read this as I'm going over it. Uh, Race-wise, 58.4, black, 37.9, Native American, 2.2, Asian, 1.5. Ethnicity, 69 or 66.9 percent. Uh, Non-Hispanic, 33.1 percent Hispanic. Um, that is um, significant. Uh, Alan mentioned, uh, Dr. Hanley, Alan mentioned speaking Spanish. Uh, if you can 
Uh, if you are bilingual, I think it takes you a long way in, that, in your career if you choose to go this route. Um, citizenship, 80% uh, US, 15% uh, consists of Mexican, Colombian, Dominican Republic, Cuban uh, persons of origin, 5% other. <coughs> the criminal offenses, why are people in federal prisons? Well, people are in federal prisons because mainly uh, they've committed a drug-related offense. 17.2% uh, uh, weapons, explosives, arson, those are the kinds of offenses that you find in the federal prison system. Um, ex uh, immigration, 7.6, that number has been going up a little bit progressively. Extortion, fraud, bribery, 6.4, burglary, larceny, property offenses, 4.7, robbery, 3.8, homicide, aggravated uh, assault, kidnapping, 3.2. Um, so, yes, when you go into a prison setting, uh, you know, how you've led your life from day to day is a little different. And uh, this is what I thought when I first walked in. <laughs> All right. Um, now, if you read about Dr. Cunningham, he's going to you're going to read uh, about his emphasis on uh, experiential learning, personal growth, personal development. Probably not his idea of personal development. Reads Criminal Minds, the young child, my mother told me I could be anyone I wanted to be. Turns out uh, the police call this identity theft. <laughs> I will be honest with you. I did not know that this is what I was going to do, as, as, is true with, as was true with Neil. In fact, uh, in my job interview, I actually said, I don't intend to work for you for more than two years. Today, I probably would not have been hired for having made that statement. Um, but I retired after 20 exciting years with a few bumps along the way. Um, I don't regret it for one second. Uh, it's made me an excellent living, um, and it's uh, been quite an, it was quite an adventure. Um, I, I did begin in Tallahassee as a staff psychologist, and we did um, establish the internship program, and as director, I got it APA accredited. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Throughout my presentation, what I want to do is emphasize the connection between my training, your training, and my success professionally. But I think that's really paramount. Alan talked about this, and I'm going to underscore that as well. Um, I left Tallahassee uh, to go to Washington, D.C. to develop drug treatment programs. Uh, I didn't know a whole lot about drug treatment, but it didn't make a difference. Technical knowledge you can pick up by reading a book. And um, later I'll tell you why that's important uh, to not consider <laughs> as important as, as some other things that you get from your training that will ensure your success. So. I went to uh, D.C. to develop these drug treatment programs. We traveled throughout the uh, nation looking at other treatment programs, reviewing the research, finding out what works, what doesn't work, what results in lower recidivism. And then we put together a nine-month residential treatment program that is now I mean, I didn't do it alone, but I did coordinate that project. I did lead that project, and with the help of a team uh, that included both doctoral and master's level professionals, we put together a program that um, was well-researched and uh, is evidence-based and um, ensures a substantial degree of um, lower, I should say, recidivism considerably. Oops. So, 
I, uh, what did I do? I left uh, DC and went to a federal prison in Tennessee as a chief psychologist. Uh, and then I uh, was promoted. I was asked to go to the federal prison complex in Butner, North Carolina, which is the flagship assessment, uh, evaluation, and treatment unit for the Bureau of Prisons. Um, and there uh, we, um, we expanded the, drug, the sex offender program from, from 40 to 100. We had a 100, level, uh, 100 inmate uh, residential drug program. We added a second one. We developed a uh, transitional care unit for inmates uh, who were hospitalized who would uh, go back to institutions after experiencing a break, of, a mental health break of one sort or another, only uh, within a short time to end up having to be returned back to a hospital. And so we wanted to figure out a way to keep that from happening. And uh, we uh, created what's called a step-down unit, which I've learned since now has been expanded. And, uh, um, a number of them are now offered throughout the United States. Uh, so I left uh, the uh, complex in North Carolina. I was asked to uh, uh, become the regional psychology administrator over uh, the psychology services uh, in the federal prisons uh, in uh, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Uh, and then lastly, I was asked to establish a new branch. Um, I had I'd, uh, developed some expertise in North Carolina, or some understanding and some expertise in handling sex offenders. And so the uh, Bureau of Prisons uh, was uh, tasked with reviewing sex offenders to determine whether they should be civilly committed. And so we developed a <coughs> treatment protocol, again, evidence-based. And, um, and that was, uh, you know, the, that was my career in the Bureau of Prisons. So, um, again, I'm going to sort of go over some of these things that um, Alan um, and Neil went uh, over. What did I do in my 20 years? What are some of the things that I did? I did interviewing of inmates. They're screened when they come in. Uh, conducted therapy. Uh, forensic, uh, conducting various groups, anger management, uh, very common in federal inmates have um, a big problem with anger management, especially those who um, have drug problems. I'll uh, just uh, mention very briefly, when I was in North Carolina, it was an amazing difference when I walked into the drug abuse treatment unit and then walked to the sex offender treatment unit. So these are both residential programs. Um, you'd walk into the drug treatment program, it was loud, and uh, there was profanity. Uh, you had to really put together programs to help inmates resolve conflicts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, you'd walk into the sex offender unit, and it was quiet, clean, how are you, Dr. So-and-so? How are you, Mr. So-and-so? How are you? Uh, different mentality. Um, suicide reconstructions or forensic evaluations. I've uh, done competency, responsibility, civil commitment, witness protection, uh, fitness for duty, uh, suicide reconstructions. As a regional administrator, when a suicide was, uh, uh, when a suicide occurred, most of the time it involved inmates, but occasionally staff members. And uh, there was a process, or there is a process, whereby you have to sort of engage in almost an investigative process to try to figure out what happened. And then you write a report. It's really actually quite fascinating. Um, hostage negotiations, uh, hostage negotiations training, uh, leadership training as an administrator, uh, over um, psychologists in uh, various prisons throughout the region, important to develop esprit de corps, camaraderie, um, all kinds of skills, again, that I think uh, are emphasized in the field of counseling and counseling psychology. 
as opposed to clinical psychology. I, I you know, I'm best friends are clinical psychologists, but, but there are unique skills and responsibilities that you're taught in this program that I think fit with what you might do if you decide to work in the setting. Uh, personnel interviews, regional uh, union negotiations, uh, I've uh, been asked to or had been asked to participate in that. Personnel interviews, as I mentioned, uh, program reviews and corrective actions uh, charged with going into different psychology programs, taking a team to see if they're in fact doing what they're supposed to do. Staff supervision, program development and evaluation, crisis management. Um, and yes, look, there are challenges, uh, <coughs> not for the faint of heart, but I don't want that to discourage you from considering this as a possibility. Uh, this is my own personal opinion. Uh, I, there is a kind of dialectic between public safety and habilitation, um, and it is a tension there. Um, and uh, I think it can be reconciled, but I think uh, it would be naive to not point that out. Uh, there are some people who find these two things uh, almost uh, contrary to each other. Um, and I think you have to sort of look at that. And I think there are times in your day-to-day -day, uh, experience that you, you, you may find, or at least I did, find myself talking to myself about this. In the Bureau of Prisons, institutional pecking order, know your place, uh, that's been mentioned, and I think Neil suggested this as well in the state system. Um, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to belabor uh, a point that the two of them, I think, articulated extremely well. Uh, but you have to know that you're dealing in an organization that has within it a culture that does include not only one, not only one element that favors you, but that pushes back against that. It's a culture of skepticism among some people. Uh, fortunately, there is enough pushback that it can be worked out, I think, with not too much difficulty, just a certain amount of insight and determination and confidence. Um, Inmate as offender, thug, object, or patient, person, subject. This is important. It's a, it's a, it's a, at least it was to me. Um, and some of it has to do with this question of um, uh, manipulation, uh, because you know, it, it is ever present. Um, that is the antisocial, psychopathic, um, Pre uh, sort of presentation or presence, I should say. But understand that it, it, it's not something that you necessarily have to encounter to a great degree. The level of psychopathy, for example, and I mean, I, are, are you familiar with that concept? Or, uh, some of you are, um, so you, I won't get into that, but it has to do with, uh, sort of a criminogenic orientation, psychologically criminogenic uh, orientation, a, a perspective that the research incidentally shows may actually have uh, Im I sort of some neurological implications. That's not to let anybody off the hook, but it's just to sort of uh, reveal, you know, to that, that that is something that is in fact uh, being demonstrated by some of the research. Uh, so yeah, you do have to do that. I mean, I you know, do remember on one occasion uh, having someone say, listen, uh, uh, Dr. Jimenez, uh, my, I need to talk to my mom. This is very important. And your calls are supposed to go through your unit counselor, but you know, you're my off, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm talking to you about it. And, I'm, and no problem, I'll, you know, I'll dial your mother up and, and, then, and see what you can say to her. And, um, and so we did that and, you know, within about uh, 30 seconds he launched into what he wanted 
her to do regarding his sentence. And I sort of just reach, reached over and ended the call. So that, you know, you, you do have that sort of thing, but it's not a big deal. Um, in the Bureau of Prisons, everyone is a CO. Alan talked about this. Uh, it is. I mean, I, you have to accept that. On the other hand, uh, at least in my mind uh, and in my heart, there were times that I experienced a little bit of uh, push and pull on that. Um, it is a high stress environment. Uh, that's why I said it's not for the faint of heart. Um, there is some <coughs> staff burnout. Um, and uh, you do have to deal, I think, with uh, the public's lack of education and difference and, out and uh, outright indignation. You know, w these people have nothing coming. But as the two prior speakers indicated, I think, um, remember that part of the purpose for doing this is public safety. Uh, and then you have to acknowledge the risk of the erosion of certain sensibilities, human sensibilities, because it can be a, a tough environment um, and, and no one should be deluded into thinking that it isn't. But uh, it is uh, nonetheless uh, a work setting, I think, that can be very rewarding. So the rewards, um, I didn't really fully appreciate this until I left the complex in North Carolina and moved to Washington, D.C., bought a house uh, in the district on Capitol Hill where my wife and I live. And uh, in Washington, D.C., any crime you commit is a federal crime. So, so you're going to go to a federal prison for the same crime that you might go to a state prison uh, in some other state. So, so these are just anecdotes, right? The Safeway, uh, just again, public safety and habilitation, I don't think it has to be one, I don't, have, I don't think it has to be public safety or habilitation. I think it's very reasonable to say public safety and habilitation. Um, so the cheese section. So I'm at the cheese section, and this uh, fellow just sort of looks over to me, and he's looking at me. I look over to him. I smile. Uh, he says, uh, you don't remember me, do you? I'm, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. And he refers to one of the programs in North Carolina. He said, that program changed my life. Up until then, um, I'd not really had the opportunity to encounter people who had been released. But this guy looked at me, associated me with this program, and all of the staff within that program, both at the master's and doctoral level. And he said, that program made a difference to me. I'm an Home Depot in the lum lumber section. You know, our house was uh, built in uh, 1917. It, you know, the floors creak. And, um, and this guy walks up to me and he said, I, I noticed you. Uh, you're Dr. You're Dr. Jimenez or Jimenez. Or <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, again, he made reference to another program. And he said, um, I'm doing, I want you to know that I'm, I, I work construction. I've got a little business and I do small projects here on the hill or uh, in DC. I asked him, well, where? You know, in, in north, Northeast or Southeast, I forget where. But he was working and he said, I'm staying out of trouble. Now, why he, you know, wanted to tell me that? I mean, I, you know, I think because his time was served and he had the opportunity to participate in a program that made a difference. Union Station is the uh, main train station in DC. Um, just walking out of there. And uh, it's also where there are tour buses. 
and tour buses pull up and people get on the tour buses and tour DC and it's, uh, it's a great way to see the city without having to walk if that's a problem. Um, and this guy in shorts and little uniform walks up and he says, again, do you remember me? I, you know, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I have a job, I'm, you know, I'm a, I've been, he, he mentioned that he had become a supervisor and he wanted me to know that he was raising his daughter by himself. And he just wanted to share that, all right? Um, District of Columbia Psychological Association, like every state uh, association, has had its ups and downs. And uh, during one of its downs, uh, it uh, put all of its furnishings in a U-Haul and, uh, and then it started to, uh, as an association, reestablish itself. <coughs> and, uh, and so this other psychologist and I went to rent a U-Haul uh, to retrieve uh, the, the belongings, right? The, and uh, the fellow who rented us the U-Haul looked at me and said, I know you. <laughs> and I said, uh, by then, you know, I thought, um, you know, I knew. And I said, well, where do I know you from? <laughs> he told me his name. Of course, in all of these instances, um, I immediately engaged these people, right? Hi, uh, well, tell me more. I mean, it was important to me to know more. And, uh, and in all of these cases, these people gained from those programs. Uh, and, and, and he also said that he had not been using drugs in his particular case and had been working and wanted, to, wanted me to know that he had not gotten into any trouble. And then um, the strangest call I got um, about, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three years after I uh, retired. I was at my computer and I was just doing something. Um, the phone rang and I answered and this woman on the other end said, uh, is this Dr. Anthony Jimenez? And I said, yes. And she said, you don't know me, but I found you. She said, I was raped when I was 16 years old. And the person who raped me raped other women. And Your name was your signature. You found this person to be a sexual predator and had him civilly committed. Now, I didn't really do that, uh, and I don't know that I'll have time to talk about that, but my last assignment, as I mentioned earlier, had to do with establishing a treatment or an, an assessment protocol to uh, determine risk assessment for civil commitment. That is, an inmate serves his or her sentence, but because of a prior sexual offense, gets evaluated to determine whether the government has the right to, to detain that person beyond their sentence, right? Because they're a sexual predator. And so uh, our, our team made that determination, and, uh, and as the section chief, it was my signature, so she thought I did it, I didn't. I mean, I did from the standpoint that I was the boss and we reviewed the case and I knew who she was talking about. But that goes back to public safety. And these assessments, again, in that branch, uh, which is not in a federal prison, incidentally, that branch is in our central office and those, some of those folks don't, don't work in federal prisons, it's per se. Um, that, that team of professionals includes both masters and doctoral level professionals. All right? Uh, so, 
let me, let me emphasize something that I think uh, Alan talked about. I was successful, extremely su successful. I mean, I was. Um, I had more opportunity than I took advantage of. I was asked to uh, leave psychology on a couple of occasions and, and, and move into the track that would lead me to be a warden um, uh, and, and possibly uh, beyond. I made the decision to do that and then withdrew. I withdrew because I like being a counseling psychologist. I enjoy it to this day as much as I enjoyed it the day that I left this program. And if you say to me, Tony, to what do you attribute your success, if you can sort of be a little reductionistic here and sort of dilute it, for me, now this might not be the case for you um, in retrospect years from now, but for me, experiential learning, Dr. Cunningham's legacy, um, counseling and interviewing skills, Alan mentioned this, uh, talking to people, whether it's an inmate or a department head, a staff member, um, a victim, group process, whether it's in a therapy group and you're trying to figure out what's going on or in a department head meeting, um, reading what's going on between people, group dynamics, group process, um, leadership. Uh, at the time, I didn't think it was as valuable because my interest was more sort of counseling clinically. But those courses in leadership, in, in consultation, and, um, and I don't, I, I don't, I think, I think uh, Dr. Peterson did that. Um, those courses made the difference in my success. Knowing how to do those things, know, knowing how to conceptualize. Um, so, transfer of knowledge. A, the APA internship committee, I think, uh, Neil mentioned this, uh, introducing videotaping. Uh, we did the same thing. Uh, because of my experience in this program, throughout my career, any time that I had anything to do with interns or students, um, I would have them sit in with me. I'd co-lead groups with them. Uh, it made a big difference. It's one thing to sort of have someone go over a tape, but if you're in there with them and they see what you're doing and you have a, a semblance of competency, um, it can go a long way. The um, witness protection program, in fact, uh, I went on my first one while I worked in Tallahassee, and one of the things that I thought about was, well, I should read some evaluations. So I asked a couple of colleagues to let me read their witness protection program evaluations, and yeah, you know, these people have to go out, right? Um, and the purpose of the evaluation is to determine whether they can meet the rigors of it, you know, can they undergo a an identity change, you know, can they live, you know, a new life? And the first, th one of the first things I realized was that the, the evaluations didn't contain, uh, they were mainly done by clinical psychologists, right? They didn't contain anything that had to do with vocational training. And so, um, I, you know, I admit I don't know to date what's going on in this field. It wasn't my particular area of expertise, but I reflected on Holland and Holland's codes or something to that effect. <laughs> and so I went back, <laughs> you know, I went back and, um, and we, I incorporated that in the next one. And that, as I'm told, led to the decision to establish a a protocol that included, and to this day now includes, a vocational assessment, a no-brainer. But if you didn't have that background or that reference point, it wouldn't have happened. Um, again, group uh, drug, uh, the, in the uh, RDAP program, the Residential Drug Abuse Pre Pre uh, Treatment Program, um, w one of the things that, that I learned traveling uh, around the country was that uh, the programs that worked were more experiential. 
I went to a federal prison uh, in, uh, in California that had a, a residential program just to see how it operated, and it's primarily didactic. And, uh, and so I went back to Washington and I said, you know, we, we've got to change this. At the time it was primarily a CBT, um, cognitive behavior therapy, didactically presented. And so we changed that. I mean, we, we kept that model because it is evidence-based and it, you know, um, so we kept the model, but we expanded it. We included small groups, we included community meetings. Um, that, of course, required an understanding and competency in process, group process and group dynamics. Um, integrated care, um, it was uh, that the inmates would attend psychology uh, services for counseling and then they'd go to health services and get uh, their medication and the two departments never met and, and so we thought, well, that doesn't really make any sense. And so we, um, make a long story short, got the psychiatrist to come to the psychology, to the consulting psychiatrist to come to the psychology department and review the psychology files so that the psychiatrist had a better frame of reference and a better understanding of what he or she was dealing with. You know, I mean just, again, consultation, uh, these things really are not rocket science. Um, they don't want to take up too much time going over this. Uh, as regional administrator, uh, oh, let me just say that the sex offender program did not have community meetings, but <coughs> when that director, because I had a director for each of these programs, right, it had multiple programs, and uh, each one had its own director. And so the director, f I suggested the director of the sex offender program go down to the drug unit, take a look at that, he came back, and within a short time, on his own, made the decision to establish community meetings. The, the reason these community meetings and this process is really important, and the reason it's important to have competent staff, um, is because in these community meetings, inmates talk, right? These, these persons talk about problems they have with each other. And, and during the normal course of the day, for them, the way to resolve those problems is often not amicably, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> Um, and so teaching them these skills where they have to stand up and talk to each other and engage in, 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 in talk that is different from what they grew up with makes a difference. And it results in having them solve problems and conflicts more effectively. Uh, uh, as a regional administrator, the leadership, consultation, negotiation, running interference, problem solving, running interference between, you know, the psychology department um, in West Virginia and, its, uh, and the warden who was having concerns about what they were doing, uh, those kinds of things. Let's see, uh, recent job developments. So, a myriad opportunities to make a difference via psychology. Uh, mental health, education, case management. I didn't include health services. We have lo a lot of public health service officers. I think I noticed a public health service officer out there somewhere. Um, we have a lot of, f an incredibly important role. Um, it's a, a different, completely different system, but it fits nicely with the, within the Federal Bureau of Prisons. That's an opportunity. I'd encourage you to consider that. Perhaps you can talk to your colleague about it. About it. Um, the, uh, they've hired now the first ever school psychologist. Why? Because so many inmates have educational deficits. <coughs> and to be honest, um, clinical and counseling psychologists in the Bureau of Prisons generally did not or do not, that means did not, and they don't work there anymore, but I trust it hasn't changed, uh, didn't really like to go down to education and uh, test an inmate bec you know, for some sort of learning disability. So now the Bureau of Prisons has decided that, that school psychologists are, you know, are important. 
and it looks like they'll be hiring some of them. Uh, I've just read on the website that they've expanded the step-down program. I think I mentioned that. Uh, the, they've expanded the residential drug treatment programs, uh, hiring of psychologists and treatment specialists. Um, so I see this program, th this, is this is how I summarize it. I see this program <laughs> as facilitating the capacity to exercise one's own agency. That's how I, I conceptualize this. It's an opportunity, uh, this program I think, uh, these programs in the plural, I think because of the way they go about teaching, um, I think it really facilitates um, you know, maximizing your own agency in whatever field you choose. And I also think that's an essential skill uh, set needed to just negotiate your way in life. Uh, I use this stuff every day. Um, so I've tried to sort of condense this, not take up too much time. Um, if you have any questions about it, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer. <laughs>